Thank you guys. Thank you for having me here today. I'm really excited to be with you to talk about naloxone and its role in the public health crisis that we're facing today. Um, I am passing around some of the available uh, uh, naloxone products that you can get within our community. Uh, so take some time to look at them, get familiar with them in case you recommend their use to one of your patients. So. Um, as was mentioned, I work in the emergency department here, and I also work as a poison specialist. So given jillions of doses of naloxone in the ER and patients coming in an overdose, and I also frequently get calls at the poison center from freaked out boyfriends saying, oh, my girlfriend's on you know, oxycodone, she's not really responding to me right now, it looks like she's breathing less, and uh, I have nothing to disclose, but when I get those calls, I always say, well, do you have naloxone? And my hope is one day when they say no, I can say, why not? Because I really think this is thing that everyone should have. There's very little harm and such a great benefit that it could have. So nothing to disclose. Objectives that I have for today, I want us to be able to state the purpose of Wisconsin Actine and its impact on naloxone availability in the community. Um, Full disclosure, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I don't work in the outpatient setting either where this actually affects most people. Um, I did speak with a lot of my outpatient colleagues. I've reviewed the laws. I'll give you some of my interpretations. Um, it's not that mind-blowing, um, but we are going to talk about it and what it's, what it's done for Wisconsin. Uh, we are going to identify patients and caregivers who might be candidates for home naloxone and then review some teaching points that if you find someone who you think is going to benefit from this, what might you talk to them about before they go and get their prescription or over-the-counter naloxone. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about some community resources that you can use to help get your patient access. Um, I knew Dr. Lerner was going to be talking a lot about epidemiology. I have a little bit in here. We might see some, uh, you might get some redundant information, but that's always good in these uh, long talks. Helps reinforce things. So, so pharmacology, so this is worth pharmacology CE. We have a really fancy opioid receptor. Uh, and we know that opioid agonists uh, are really anything that activates an opioid receptor. We have three kind of classical opioid receptors, which would be mu, kappa, and delta. There's also a few others, the opioid-like receptor and nocio receptors. But they're uh, located centrally and peripherally. And when we have central opioid agonism, we get analgesia, sedation, euphoria, whole host of uh, clinical effects. But when we have excessive opioid agonism, we get overdose. So opioid overdose uh, can occur in a lot of different scenarios. So it can occur during therapeutic use. You have a patient who's prescribed opioids for their pain. Maybe they have a change in their ability to clear the drug and it accumulates, they overdose, or they're just started on an opioid. They don't really know how to use it and it's a little bit too much for them. Um, it occurs in intentional abuse quite frequently of either prescription opioids being intentionally abused or of illicit opioids such as heroin or crocodile, some of the new stuff coming out. And it can occur in unintentional ingestion. So it's not uncommon for us to get calls about, uh, you know, young toddlers at the poison center uh, who got into some methadone that was in the fridge or a uh, husband took wife's Norco thinking that it was ibuprofen or methadone, thinking that it's ibuprofen, and then they wind up in the ICU. Um, but what we do see from any excessive opioid agonism, regardless of the cause, reduced sensitivity to changes in oxygen and CO2 beyond their normal threshold, decreased tidal volume, reduced respiratory frequency, and then finally respiratory depression and death due to hypoventilation. And this death due to hypoventilation is becoming quite a problem these days. So opioid deaths have quintupled since 1999 to about 2016. Uh, we saw some graphs earlier with Milwaukee demographic data. Uh, you know, we've seen a rise in prescription opioid deaths, still currently, I believe, the number one killer of Wisconsinites uh, in terms of drug deaths. And then in 2010, we started to see a rise in fen or, uh, heroin. And in 2013, we started to see a rise in deaths related to heroin tainted with fentalogs or the, the new synthetic opioids. Uh, it is now such a problem that it's the leading cause of accidental death within the United States, specifically between 25 to 64. So unintentional poisonings from drugs being the leading cause of death 
for uh, about a 30 or almost 40 year span of age. And of these unintentional poisonings, roughly 75 to 80% of them are opioid related. Uh, and then overall, throughout the United States, unintentional poisonings, mainly opioids, have now become the number one cause of accidental death within the U.S., eclipsing motor vehicle accidents. And in 2010, uh, 31 states, it's actually more than this now, but in 2010, 31 states had opioid overdose deaths uh, being the number one accidental death as opposed to motor vehicle collisions, and that includes Wisconsin. Uh, and if we drill down into Wisconsin, Milwaukee is one of the uh, worst afflicted states. It's very hard to read that, but the three-year crude rate of drug overdose death involving opioids by county. You can see Milwaukee has 21.4, uh, I believe this is per 100,000, for the three-year crude rate. And the only county that actually beats us would be Menominee County, and they have a much smaller denominator. <laughs> So it makes sense. We're, more, we're a metro area. We tend to see a lot more drug use and trafficking into our area. Um, but this is certainly quite a problem. It affects uh, us on a national level. It affects us on a state level. And it affects us on a county and city level. And this is really a public health issue. Uh, when we realized that motor vehicle collisions were causing deaths left and right, we did things about it. There's things you could put into place. We created quirky uh, billboards that say, uh, don't be dying to text your friend. And we educated people that, uh, you know, drinking and driving and, and crack down on laws. Uh, we reduced deaths due to motor vehicle collisions. And that wasn't even really a medical issue. That was just a societal behavior issue. But we, as a medical community, have encountered public health crises before. So cardiac arrest is one example of a public health crisis that we've had to deal with. It's a public health issue with widespread incidence, just like opioids. It has severe impact on human health and well-being, just like opioids. And just like any public health crisis, there's strategies we can use to prevent the severe sequelae from opioid overdose. So with cardiac arrest, what did we do? Well, we increased public awareness of cardiac arrest. We said, hey, People are collapsing left and right. What should you do about it when you see it? We trained the public to do cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We trained them to use automated external defibrillators. We took the onus out of our hands and gave it to the people who are actually seeing this happen. Because we could treat any over opioid overdose that occurs in the ER, but when it's happening uh, over two-thirds in, in people's own home, own home, what can we really do about that? And what we found is that public access to rescue saves lives. If you increase the available rescue, you're going to increase the amount of lives you save. So we've seen it in numerous different outlets. If you train the public, lay people, how to provide life-saving interventions, they will happily do it. And AEDs, you know, depending on what sources you're looking at, are only 66% effective even with absolute perfect use. I mean, if you saw somebody on the floor, how many people feel comfortable grabbing an automated external defibrillator right now and they feel like they'd be able to use it 100% with no errors? That's good, and we're trained healthcare professionals, right? And even if we use it 100% with no errors, it's still only going to work 66% of the time. And it has some very complicated instructions like, Look for puddles and wipe down the patient with that rag you keep in your pocket all the time. Or uh, maybe grab that straight edge razor you got tucked in your shoe, shave them up. I know. I'm glad we're all ready to do that, though, at any moment. So I know what you're thinking. Man, I wish there was a 100% effective antidote if used at appropriate times that did not require me to wipe anyone down or shave them and I could use it to combat a public health crisis. Well, you are in luck. Naloxone and you, this is where we get into it. Okay. So public naloxone access is underused, and a variety of organizations have recognized this. The CDC has said that expanding naloxone access could reduce drug overdose deaths and save lives. The American Medical Association has been a longtime supporter of naloxone for first responders and by, uh, bystanders who can use it. The American Society of Addiction Medicine has said this is cheap and effective 
let's get people using it. And even the American Pharmacists Association said, we want to be on the front line of making sure we're identifying people who can use this effective antidote. And it works, too. So yes, we can get it out into the community. Does it have an impact? One great researcher out in uh, Boston, where a lot of this is taking place, named Alexander Wally, they did a time-interrupted analysis. So they looked at 19 different zip codes where the rate of opioid overdose death, the yearly rate of opioid overdose death, was at least five per year. And then they implemented what's called opioid education in the Loxone distribution programs, OEND. So they brought people in, they taught them how to use naloxone, they taught them about opioid overdose, and they said, go, go use your skills in the community. And uh, what they found is, well, before they did this, the rate of opioid overdose death was 100. That's the comparator, okay? So when I have zero people trained how to use naloxone, rate of opioid overdose death is 100%, assuming, you know, that, that's our max amount. If you train people, anywhere from zero to 100 people within that zip code on how to use naloxone, the five-year rate of opioid overdose death was decreased by 27%. So that's 100 per 100,000, meaning in Milwaukee, that would be training 900 people how to use naloxone, which AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin has already done. Uh, and if you increase that amount of training up to 200, you know, anywhere from 100 to 250 per uh, 100,000, we saw an almost half reduction in the rate of fatal opioid overdose death, the rate of deaths showing up to the medical examiner with opioids in their body. Uh, and they looked at some other things here. They actually didn't see a big increase in healthcare cost utilization. Um, so they were finding that this was effective and cost effective. Right? We're not burdening the healthcare system with, the, with this by saving all these lives and sending them to the hospital. Uh, it wasn't increasing costs that much either. So it works. We give it to the community. We have the evidence to show that it works. So what are we doing as uh, Wisconsinites? So in 2013, there was Wisconsin Act 200, which was the Opioid Overdose and Opioid Antagonist Act. And what this did was allow for prescribers to write standing orders to pharmacies and to write prescriptions for patients or persons who will be in the scenario to help an overdose. So it said, hey, you can write a prescription for naloxone for your patient or you can write a prescription for naloxone for your patient's best friend who uh, can use the naloxone to treat that patient in overdose. It also increased utilization amongst first responders it uh, allowed basically basic EMTs, um, any paramedic, firefighters, police uh, officers to, to be able to use naloxone too. So it expanded our first responders and it allowed for prescribers to start writing to people who they might not have a direct prescriber patient relationship with. And then this is where we introduced the civil immunity too. So uh, Dr. Lerner talked about this as well, but any person who prescribes naloxone is immune, and any person who administers aloxone or naloxone is immune uh, from civil or criminal liability. Meaning it gave you some protection if you gave naloxone to your patient and they went home and overdosed, I mean, you couldn't be sued for you know, encouraging people to overdose or that kind of thing. Uh, and then in Wisconsin Act uh, 115, which passed in 2015, they expanded this even more. So what this was allowed a prescriber to authorize pharmacists to dispense opioid antagonists to a patient under a standing order. And as soon as that came available, Dr. John Myman, who's the chief medical officer of the Department of Health uh, in Wisconsin, said, hey, any pharmacy that wants to prescribe naloxone, use my name, you're good to go. So what this did was basically make naloxone over the counter. Nobody, you no longer actually even have to see a provider. Uh, you can get it straight from the pharmacy. 
And all pharmacies, if you work in a clinic and you want your pharmacy to start prescribing naloxone, it's very easy. There's plenty, uh, the Department of Health provides very easy training. It's one hour of training. You have to provide specific educational materials on naloxone overdose, and you have to report your dispensing. But any clinic pharmacy could also begin this process very easily. Uh, so let's say you, who should you identify or who might be a good candidate for a naloxone prescription or to be encouraged to use naloxone? Well, we want to look at those who are at risk for overdose. Um, so some risk factors that we know can increase your chance of overdose. Mixing substances, um, if you remember Dr. Lerner's, something like 72% of the overdoses had multiple substances in them. Benzodiazepines are uh, just behind opioids and, her uh, you know, prescription opioids and heroin for killing um, even Wisconsinites, so they're also a very common co-ingestion. So someone who you know uses multiple substances or has prescriptions for uh, other set of substances like benzos, uh, even some gabapentinoids and antidepressants. Um, people who recently were abstinent from opioids, so people leaving incarceration um, or people who have completed substance use rehabilitation programs where they were abstinent from opioids. People who are known to use alone, uh, people who are getting their drugs from unknown sources because of contamination, fentalogs being in there, that kind of a thing. Uh, really anyone with a chronic medical disease, so chronic heart, lung, liver disease. If you have chronic kidney or liver disease, you might have impaired clearance of opioids. Uh, you might be more um, prone to the adverse effects if you have chronic respiratory illnesses or cardiac disease and then people on long-acting opioids. So really, I just described basically everyone. Everyone's at risk for overdose and everyone should get naloxone. But it really doesn't hurt. So uh, basically, the CDC says that anyone who's at uh, a dose of 50 milligrams of morphine equivalent per day should have naloxone prescription offered to them. And that's really all it is, is a conversation and an offering. Uh, and it's an easy enough one to start. And then what some pharmacies are doing, um, you know, they have these screening checklists. So they say, okay, is this prescription for yourself or for someone else? Do you have any history of breathing problems, history of smoking, kidney or liver uh, problems? Are you on other sedative prescriptions? Are you on a prescription for an antidepressant, not one we commonly think about? Uh, are you receiving uh, methadone maintenance therapy or opioid replacement therapy? First time being prescribed opioids, or you want a really high dose of opioids? It's a lot of people. And once you t check, or tip that yes box, it really just starts the conversation. So what happens when you find somebody who might be at a higher risk from overdose? You can do a focused overdose history and just ask the person, have you ever overdosed before? Are they abusing illicit substances? That's a great question to ask. Um, even if they're on therapeutic uh, uh, drugs, people from polypharmacy frequently come into the emergency department for uh, therapeutic use of their drugs, but that day they happen to be exhibiting an opioid toxidrome because it started to accumulate on them. So some people, even with therapeutic use, uh, have overdosed before. Or identify someone who might be around those who are overdosing. So have you ever witnessed an overdose? What do you plan to do if you see someone overdose? Are you equipped with the tools to fight this? And are you interested in having preventative resources? Real question starts a conversation uh, that can lead to somebody equipping themselves to help us fight the opioid epidemic. So let's say you find someone that you want to get opioid or to get naloxone. Uh, how can you prescribe it? Well, you don't have to, for one, because it's available over the counter, but your push as a prescriber certainly encourages patients to uh, arm themselves. Um, but the different routes and formulations that are available, um, they're being passed around right now. There's the intramuscular 0.4 milligram per ml vial, um, which does require the patient to be able to draw that up into a syringe and inject it into the patient. There's the intramuscular auto-injector, the FCO auto-injector, um, which you guys saw a picture of before. And that's like the EpiPen that talks to you 
Uh, it's also just like EpiPens, incredibly expensive. So I don't really see that within the community. But FCO does offer, uh, I believe, some coupons. I think it's still pretty expensive. And then you have the intranasal solution, which is that thing that looks like Flonase that I'm passing around. Um, and there's also the 2 milligram per 2 ml syringe, which just like cardiac epinephrine is a snap syringe. As you can see here, you kind of it's a lure lock syringe and you can just lock it together. So it's pretty simple to use. Um, all of these are available. The most common one that you'll see at a retail pharmacy is going to be this 4 milligram per 0.1 ml intranasal solution. So that's usually what people will be getting. Um, there is not necessarily a standardized method for responding to an opioid overdose, but um, if you give somebody these uh, uh, naloxone, we want to help them figure out how to use it. So the Department of Health has a really great uh, info card on how to respond to an overdose, and it's, it's pretty standardized. Uh, but the first is, you know, identify an overdose. So is somebody lethargic or not responding to you? Uh, they don't have to stop breathing. We can consider that an overdose. Second, call 911, just like if you uh, arrive to uh, a code on a floor or somebody's lost pulses, the first thing you do, activate the emergency response. Get everybody else in there with you. But call 911. There's civil immunity for you if you call 911. Uh, then provide rescue breaths for 30 seconds. And if the patient is not responding after 30 seconds of noxious stimuli and rescue breaths, then give naloxone. And the key point here is after you give naloxone, you want to continue rescue breathing. Don't just sit back and allow anoxic brain injury to set in. Uh, keep rescue breathing because the onset of action of naloxone is around three to five minutes, uh, especially with the routes that are used in the community, which would be intramuscular or intranasal generally. Lastly, if the patient starts kicking you off of them, that's a good sign. You have some recovery. You want to put them into the recovery position, oftentimes, the opioid withdrawal that you just precipitated may induce some vomiting, um, so we don't want them to aspirate. So you lead them, put them in the left lateral position to aid with that. And finally, wait until help arrives. So this info card, I'm going to show you guys a website where you can find something like this, um, and you can distribute these to anybody that you are also uh, recommending getting naloxone. Um, but also, every pharmacy that they pick this up from should provide education on how to respond to naloxone overdoses as well. So just some counseling pearls. If you do have someone who you're recommending get naloxone, uh, the onset is about three to five minutes to see the effect. So they do need to continue giving rescue breaths after naloxone is administered. And the duration of action is about 30 to 90 minutes. So for heroin, generally, it's pretty short acting in terms of its peak effect. Um, and one dose of naloxone is usually good for that. But if somebody's on like a long-acting opioid or they took a lot of heroin, um, then we might see re-overdose when the naloxone wears off. So most prescriptions and uh, are written for two uh, naloxone doses, just like EpiPens, you usually have two on you in case you know symptoms recur after you got stung. It's the same with naloxone. Uh, and then you might precipitate a withdrawal, and we're arming the lay people, so they might not know this. So we want to make sure we educate them to not allow the overdose victim to take more opioids, even though they're going to feel like they really want to. Okay, so prescribe to prescribetoprevent.org is a fantastic website. Uh, you can go on there and just choose really where you're coming from. Are you a prescriber? Are you a pharmacist? Uh, prescribers, they have primary, chronic pain, palliative, emergency medicine, substance use. You can kind of pick what avenue you're coming from. Um, and then there's tons of great patient education handouts that you can grab from this. And it's just a resource you can use to, uh, if you want to implement some kind of screening and naloxone distribution program within your own clinic or your own practice. Another great uh, resource is just the Department of Health. So Wisconsin DHS has a ton of patient education materials and print-ready materials uh, that you can keep, you know, on the outside of the waiting room in a clinic uh, for people to read about or implement into the screen of any visit that you have. If you're looking for a pharmacy that prescribes naloxone, uh, they do have to, or that uh, dispenses naloxone, they have to report it to the state. 
So as you can see, we have tons of them within Milwaukee, so there's really no shortage. Freighter, uh, our pharmacy dispenses, most major retailers dispense them as well. There are some challenges to prescribing, so reimbursement is not 100% throughout various insurers. Medicaid will cover a patient of record, but if you're prescribing it for, for their, to their friend, they're probably not going to be covered. However, that friend's insurance, they might have their own insurance. Private health care insurers, it's kind of inconsistent, um, but there is a chance that it could be covered. Uh, the cash prices vary quite a bit. Currently, I just did some calling in April to find out how much it was. Walmart was running the lowest cost with $37 for one of those intranasal. Um, freighter is about $76, and the most expensive being Roundies at about $150. But there's other options. You can go to GoodRx.com. This is just a generic prescription discount page. Um, they do have some coupons for the 2 milligram per 2 ml IM injector that I passed around. Um, but really, none of that matters because if you want your patient to have naloxone, it is absolutely free through the AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin. So if they really don't want to go down to ARCW, give them some of those other resources. But I, uh, we do Secret Santa at the Poison Center, and I wanted to get one of the toxicologists there a great gift. And what's a toxicologist without antidotes on hand? So I was like, i got to get him some naloxone. So I went down to the AIDS Resource Center of Wisconsin, and I went through the whole process that they go through when you request to get naloxone. And it is so easy. It takes 15 minutes, and they go through not only how to respond to an opioid overdose, not only uh, you know, call 911, get your syringe ready, give 30 seconds of rescue breathing. Uh, they walk through each of the different formulations. They provide tons of different resources for people who are already uh, abusing substances, including things like hepatitis and HIV screening. I mean, it's a fantastic, and all this in 15 minutes, it was a full service. Uh, so those that I'm passing around, I got from the AR, uh, ARCW and went through their process. And they're completely free. Uh, they get them donated, or the, and there is some state funding for, for it. Um, so I believe it's on 17th, or second in Plankington, um, but just call this number here <laughs> and you can figure out where it is and they're very responsive. They will uh, train on how to use naloxone and distribute it. So if someone is interested, there's no reason why they can't get it. Uh, I think that's all that I had. I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any at this time.